From electric cars to cricket flour, the world today seems obsessed with sustainable living, always looking for a solution to the problem of dwindling resources. Many of these proposed solutions come with problems of their own, but the spiritual problems might be even worse. How do we envision a future of scarcity? I mean, look at our art. From Soylent Green to A Modest Proposal, which is also the tagline of today's show, our minds always seem to treat people as expendable and use death as a solution to problems of life on Earth. Surely, life isn't imitating art, right? Or is it? Welcome to Something's Happening Here. God bless you, friends. Welcome back, friends. Happy Tuesday. Uh, today's show is, uh, it, it was fun for me to write, but it is kind of gross. So <laughs> heads up, we are talking about death a lot today. And uh, from a worldly point of view, not a biblical point of view. So I mentioned a couple pieces of art in the opener, and uh, Soylent Green is probably uh, probably something you've at least heard of, if not seen. The concept of this movie is uh, in a kind of dystopian future tense society where environmentalism has not been heated as it should have been, and now the world is like an enemy, right? We're being um, hit with famines and big weather and whatnot. And the, uh, a solution in that movie is a, a green product, Soylent. Did, by the way, did you even know that that word Soylent comes from soy and lentils? <laughs> so it's, it's a vegetarian product that's going to help save the world. But it, the hook is that it turns out it's actually made of people, right? The dead bodies of dead people. So we are recycling corpses to keep our uh, resources in plentiful supply. A modest proposal, which is much older, it's from the 1700s, I believe. This is a satirical essay about the aristocracy in Ireland at the time, but it takes the form of proposing a solution to the rampant poverty. And that solution is to uh, take away children from impoverished people who can't raise them slaughter the children, and turn them into food for the poor people who can't afford food. And so we're actually recycling a family's child into the meal for that family in this essay. Really gross. My point in those things is that, I mean, one of them is satire, the other is just kind of a dystopian vision of the future, but both of them use death as the mechanism to solve the problem that they are dealing with. And unfortunately... I would love to relegate this only to artwork, but it's not. So let's check out this article from The Blaze. It's called Post-Christian Social Ethics. Alarming number of young Canadians think the poor and mentally ill should be eligible for voluntary extermination by the state. Yikes, the date on this is May 8th, so just uh, like last week. And it's kind of a long article, so I'll just hit the highlights. <clears throat> The president of this research company that, that took this poll indicated that on the basis of, a, of the poll conducted from April 22 to 24 of this year, among 1,000 adults, here was the results. 43% said that mental illness is a good enough reason for a Canadian over the age of 18 to seek state-assisted suicide. 20% said that state-assisted suicide should always be allowed. 24% said parents who helped terminate their terminally ill son or daughter should receive no penalty at all. 50% said they would support the volunteered extermination of persons with disabilities. Uh, wow, I mean, that's ableism at a, an ex extreme, right? 28% said they would agree to allow adults to receive state-assisted suicide due to poverty. You don't have enough money, and that's a good enough reason to take away your life now. And then 27% said they would agree to allow adults to receive state-assisted suicide due to homelessness. Man, I mean, I don't really like the homeless epidemic that exists here in California, but I don't think we should kill these people. <laughs> I think we should help these people, not murder them. 
And it goes on to break down these responses by age, and the claim is made that young people, more so than older people, feel this way. And so uh, later on in the article, with less religion, there are fewer qualms about killing the weak. The article says, some suspect a correlation between this apparent support for the state's elimination of the weak and infirm and the decline of religion in Canada a nation that recently removed all Christian religious imagery from its heraldry and has witnessed a precipitous decline in regular religious engagement. The point of this is to say, when you take away the kind of moral safeguards of Christianity, this is what's left. When you don't recognize the inherent value of the image of God inside another person, then why not just murder them because they're a burden on society, right? Why not? solve the homeless problem by simply exterminating the homeless. I think this is a problem about God. And here's kind of a a funny other thing, right? Soylent green is made of people. At least we're not eating people, right? Except the FDA just approved the first pill made from human poop. So we actually are now consuming at least pieces of people. Um, This newly approved pill called Voust also contains live bacteria and has been approved for use in people ages 18 and older as a preventative treatment for recurrent infections with the bacterium C. diff, for short. Um, And so this is a medicine, it's not a food, but my point is we are going the route of a modest proposal and the route of Soylent Green. It's beginning in medicine, but who knows where it's going to go you know that things never stop at the good. They always progress to the bad. And why is it a problem that we are consuming medicine made of feces? Well, because right here in Ezekiel 4, we see that God told Ezekiel to make a a loaf of bread, this is a prophetic thing, but to make it using um, human waste as fuel. We see this in Ezekiel 4 verse 12. And then Ezekiel's answer in verse 14, he says, Lord God, indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. What is Ezekiel talking about? Well, God knows. So in verse 15, God corrects the problem. He says, see, I'm giving you cow dung instead of human waste, and you shall prepare your bread over it. And so the bread wasn't the problem. It was the fuel made of human feces that was the problem. It was, it's, it's so horrifically unclean that the prophet objected and God consented and said, all right, I was wrong. <laughs> I'll take away the human waste. I'll give you some cow dung instead. So, I mean, it is... You can say what you want about C. diff. I know that's a bad infection that, that, that kills a lot of people. So maybe this will be a good medicine that is effective. I don't know. My only point is we're pushing the boundaries of the acceptable things to put in your body to such a degree that we're running into prophecy about it. God already said, don't eat your poop. (laughs) That's, man, I feel weird that I have to say that on on the air. (laughs) All right. Okay. Is it Christian to murder um, people who are less well off than you? Euthanasia is all about mercy, right? You just murder the people who don't want to be alive anymore. Okay, well, James chapter 1 in verse 27 tells us that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I don't know how it gets any clearer than that. What God wants from us I mean, in addition to love for him, but the thing that's supposed to follow from our love for God is love for one another. And specifically to go help the widow who at the time that the book of James was written was um, just about the least fortunate member of society, right? Women didn't have very many rights. They couldn't do very very many things. They were reliant upon their husbands, the men and, and their sons in theory. And so a widow... Uh, has no husband to care for her. And else uh, in the book of Matthew, we realized there was a system in place at the time to remove a child's responsibility to care for his aging uh, parent. So a lot of widows simply had no recourse at all. James says, you know, God wants you to go care for that person. 
and the orphan too, the one who has no parents to teach it how to be a grown-up and help it grow up safely in, <laughs> in a well-rounded manner. Go care for them. That's true religion. But in our post-Christian society, we have internalized that message as, oh, they're a burden on society, let's just go kill them. Or let, let's allow them to kill themselves, right? Let's make this available so they can exterminate their own lives. It's, it's really horrifically anti-Christian. And in Matthew 25, there's a famous parable about the sheep and the goats. And when Christ returns, he separates everybody into one of these two groups. And the good group is commended for um, feeding him, that means Jesus, and giving him drink when he's thirsty and taking him in and clothing him when he's naked, right? And so in verse 37, these righteous answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And then Christ, the king, will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So what does it mean when instead of clothing and visiting and helping the least of these Christ's brethren, we murder them instead? What you have done to the least of these, you've done to me. We're trying to murder God. Or we're trying to allow God to murder himself. That's not going to end well, friends. And here's a little bit of a history lesson as well. This idea of caring for the least able to care for themselves is as old as Christianity. One of the ways the church exploded the way it did in, those, in that first generation is because the culture at the time had such little regard for females, you know, for girls, that it was perfectly acceptable if a woman gave birth to a baby girl and the, the man of the house didn't want a baby girl, wanted a son instead, you could simply take the baby girl out into the woods and leave it there to die or get eaten by an animal or whatever. And so the Christian church intervened on this and they went into the woods hunting for these abandoned babies. And when they'd find them, they would take them in, adopt them, so to speak, make them part of the church, raise them in the church in the fear and knowledge of God. And so... I, I, I love that fact about history, you know? The church is literally building itself by picking up the unwanted scraps of humanity that are discarded by everybody else. That is still our burden today. And I hope that when we see our neighbor to the north uh, voluntarily exterminating the least of these Christ's brethren, that should alarm us. It should make us want to make sure that never happens here, especially with the homeless population we have in California. Have mercy. Can you imagine exterminating them all? That would be a, a, like a, a, a human tragedy if we did that. That would be horrible. Um, and so what do we do with it? We have to be different than the world. The world is hateful toward life. The world murders unborn babies, murders people who don't want to be alive anymore, murders God if it can, right? The world is hateful towards life. We have to be the opposite of that. We have to cherish and uplift human life and show the world that there's a different way. Is that your desire, friends? You want to be contrary to the world and show them that the ways of God are better? Pray with me now. Thank you, Father, for having a better way. And thank you for giving us your grace enough to elevate us to receive and demonstrate that better way to a scared and dying world. We know we need your grace, Father, because the world is hateful towards you, it is hateful towards life, and it's hateful towards us who love you and cherish life. So help us. Do this for us. Win this battle for us. Go ahead of us and show us how to get it done. Father, forgive our sins. Forgive us for the ways we've fallen short, but empower us to not fall short anymore and to be an example for those who also are looking for a better way.
Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good luck out there, friends. It's a big task, but we serve a big God, and he's going to help you through it. So your job is to listen to God and also come back tomorrow. Make sure you're subscribed, okay? On Facebook, like our page. Change your notifications. Um, on YouTube, Talking Donkey International's YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit your notification bell. I think it's a bell on YouTube. Um, TalkingDonkeyInternational.org slash podcast. You want to bookmark that page. That's a great page. you got a lot of easy, accessible archives on that page. Rumble, we love Rumble. Go over to Rumble and follow. It's just a one-button follow on Rumble. And on um, Locals, it's kind of like Facebook. You, you create an account. It's free. But I am begging you in the name of Jesus, don't just stop at the free account. Become a paid supporter. You will directly help us to stay on the air and gain access to a bunch of extra content um, every Friday. That's our plan. God bless you. Have a great night. We'll see you here tomorrow on Something's Happening Here.